Well, welcome to this webinar um, that ICP is hosting uh, on uh, political and economic reform in Kazakhstan. Um, just before I hand over the word to Yuan Engval, I would just like to remind you all about that we do not uh, tolerate any discriminatory language in the comments, but we encourage you to ask questions in the Q&A function. And also for your knowledge, the, the webinar is being recorded, even though only the panelists will be shown in the recording and this will later be published on our YouTube channel. But now I hand over the word to Johan to start the webinar today. Thank you very much. So yes, I'm Johan Engvall, non-resident fellow of this institute. And I wanna welcome you all to this online event on political and economic reforms in Kazakhstan under President Tukayev. Uh, with us here today, we have first Dr. Svante Kornel, uh, the director and co-founder of this institute, who has written a report on this topic. So he will be the main speaker today. But we also have two guests, commentators. First, we have Dr. Alia Skai, who is a research fellow at the School of Management uh, at the University of St. Andrews. Uh, she has a lo long-standing expertise in the study of global energy, um, sustainable development. Uh, I think you have also written recently a book about global norms, uh, which has been quite um, positively reviewed, I've, I've seen. Um, and just also earlier, I remember being a visitor here at the Stockholm when we had presented another study on Kazakhstan's um, policy towards Europe. And our second commentator uh, is uh, Damjan Krenjevic um, Miskovic, who is a director of policy research and publications and professor of practice uh, at Azerbaijan's ADA University. And he previously served as advisor to Serbia's president and foreign minister. So I wanna welcome all of you to this. Um, and I will, first of all, hand over to Dr. Svante Kornel for giving your speech on this topic. And then I will hand over to Alia and then Damjan for commentaries. So please, Svante, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Johan. And thank you to our commentators also for joining us. And I'm looking forward to our discussion. I would like to first, uh, to begin our, uh, uh, th this uh, short uh, presentation of our study by a, a little bit of background. Uh, our joint center between the Central Asia Caucasus Institute and the Silk Road Studies Program at ISTP has for quite some time been focused on the issue of uh, reform movements uh, in uh, Central Asia and the Caucasus. Uh, some of you will remember that we published in three years ago a book on the reform uh, going on in Uzbekistan after President, uh, uh, President Mirziyoyev uh, came to power in that country. Uh, we've also published, to some extent, shorter studies or articles about the reform process in Kazakhstan as well as in Azerbaijan. And uh, the time now came for a fuller study of the reform process that got started after, or uh, should we say, in a new, new gear, after President Kasim Jamart Tokayev uh, uh, came to power in, in Kazakhstan following the uh, uh, unexpected, I guess we should say, resignation of uh, the first president, Nur Sultan Azerbaijan. Uh, so the, um, I think a broader way of looking at this uh, in terms of the broader region of Central Asia and the Caucasus or even of Eurasia or the post-communist region more broadly is I think a note that uh, Dr. Engvall and I discussed just before this uh, seminar started, which is the, the extent to which the uh, countries of the post-Soviet uh, sphere have been resistant to reform. It's been particularly difficult to uh, achieve sustainable reform, both of a political and economic nature in these states. Uh, and one of the reasons I think, so there are several reasons for this, which we may not have time to go into, uh, going to how the um, Soviet economic and political system was structured, but also how the transition to independence took place in which there was in many countries a fusion of political and economic power that appears to be very hard uh, uh, to shift. Uh, some countries have undergone color revolutions, or should we say revolutionary forms of change, uh, 
This was very much supported by Western academics, think tankers, diplomats, officials. Uh, after a certain level of frustration about the lack of democratic reform in, in the post-Soviet space. But a decade and a half after these color revolutions, I think it's clear that they did not deliver to the extent that was expected or hoped. Uh, Ukraine, Kyrgyzstan have gone through several revolutions by now. Uh, they have not been able to successfully deal with problems of corruption and many other problems ailing this, this part of the world. They have advanced the uh, uh, freedom of speech and uh, other freedoms and, in their countries, but it remains very uneven. Uh, Dr. Engvall, of course, has written on Kyrgyzstan, is, is about to publish a longer Silk Road paper about uh, the history of parliamentarism in Kyrgyzstan with our institute just uh, very soon. Um, so that is one model, and we've seen also in Georgia, which for a long time was the forerunner among these countries that are undergone revolutionary change, also backtracking very clearly, and most recently getting into some kind of uh, uh, war of words with the European Union about the uh, quite gently worded uh, recommendations that have been voiced from, from EU circles. Uh, but there is another model that I think is being... Um, is being witnessed right now, and that is what you could call, if you will, an authoritarian modernization model that Kazakhstan has been in many ways a leader of. Uzbekistan and Azerbaijan seem to be on the same train, a model in which uh, the country's leadership maintains political control, but engages in top-down gradual reform that at first touched only the economy, but I think everywhere it became clear to the leadership that that would not be enough. It was necessary also to engage in political reform because uh, the economic reforms required it. Um, I think it's too early to say whether this model will work any better than the model of revolutionary change, if you will. Uh, but both paths to reform have serious challenges. And I think it's important to understand what is happening in these countries that have chosen a top-down uh, path to reform. What is it they're doing? What is it they are not doing? Uh, for us to understand how these uh, reforms are advancing and also uh, how Western countries should approach the, uh, the developments within these countries. Now, as a form of introduction to Kazakhstan in particular, I'd like to say that uh, it's one of the reasons why Kazakh looking at reforms in Kazakhstan is, uh, is important is the ambitions that the country has set for itself uh, and the uh, goals it has advanced in terms of joining the OECD, as well as being among the world's 30 most developed countries by the middle of the century. Um, all of these large initiatives or visions were la launched by the first president of Kazakhstan, um, most notably in 2012, the Kazakhstan 2050 strategy. Um, and I think that it's been clear to everybody that to reach this type of lofty goals, far-reaching reforms are necessary. Some of these we touched on in our uh, paper that Dr. Engvall was a part of, and Ali Atskai was part of our discussion here in Stockholm a few years ago on this, of exactly which criteria Kazakhstan needs to advance the most when it comes to joining the OECD or coming to the level of OECD uh, criteria. And obviously, those were the ones that touch on political issues most clearly. Um, until recently, however, uh, the Kazakh approach was to focus on economic reform, not on political reform. President Nazarbayev on numerous occasions was very clear. He said, uh, we say the economy first, then politics. This is a typical quote from President Nazarbayev. He said it many times at many occasions. But this is no longer the case. The, there has been a major shift, uh, and I think that's a result of the shift in the global political economy in the past decade, which forced a revision to this strategy, or perhaps within the government of Kazakhstan, it tipped the balance in favor of the for forces that sought to engage in more comprehensive reform. Uh, I think by 2015, if not earlier, it became clear that a focus on economics alone would not be sufficient for Kazakhstan to reach its stated goals, and that the diversification of the economy re required uh, reforms that went deep into the political realm. And also, I think this move towards also including political reforms has been a result of the country's successful economic development, which led to a, a population of Kazakhstan that has increasingly begun to voicing uh, demands of a political nature, 
that are exactly what you would expect from uh, political science theory in terms of countries that develop a middle class and that generates a demand for reform in society. We've seen exactly that happen, I believe. Now, of course, the reforms in the political field did not begin with, uh, with President Kaev. Um, they were launched, many of them, prior to the unexpected resignation of President Nazarbayev in 2019. There had been constitutional amendments to strengthen the role of the parliament, uh, but, but it became more explicit after President Tokayev came to power uh, that the reform agenda now explicitly focused on simultaneous political and economic reform on parallel tracks. And we've seen three yearly state of the nation addresses by the president in which he has issued criticism of uh, the way the country is being run that has been staffing at times um, and emphasized the priority that his administration will give to systemic reform. And he has also introduced several new institutions to oversee these reforms, most notably the National Council of Public Trust, which brings together government officials with respected members of uh, civil society, think tanks, academia, and so forth an institution uh, with working groups that has been a vehicle for the generation of reforms and the deliberation of these reforms. And it's uh, a very uniquely in this part of the world, we see how the president of the country is not only coming in to give a speech and then leave at this type of events, but has very much been sitting and being a part of, uh, of these discussions. Uh, our report, which um, uh, I won't try to mention everything in it, but I'll mention a few of the main uh, elements that we cover. Um, we talk about reforms in the economic field, which of course are not new, but there is a new urgency, I think, to these reforms. Um, in that really have to do with a digitalization and a diversification of the economy of Kazakhstan. And that very much is a result of the two of uh, crisis of 2008 and 2014-15, and the price shocks that revealed just how vulnerable the Kazakh economy was to the oil price. And it catalyzed a mobilization toward reform that reduced the country's dependence on fossil fuels. This, of course, is something that many countries have tried to do. And not all have succeeded. It is something uh, very difficult. But what Kazakhstan is trying to do is to energize its manufacturing and ag agricultural sector, most notably. Uh, focusing on developing what they call an economy of simple things for the nation to become a primary producer of uh, low-tech products that people use every day, rather than importing them and instead perhaps exporting them to their neighbors. And in the agricultural field, the country is trying to mobilize government resources to support separate, like they call ecosystems of food and agricultural production, to be a breadbasket of, of, of Eurasia. Uh, Kazakhstan is also undergoing a number of reforms to drive technological advancement in order to develop an entrepreneurial culture, attract investments to the tech industry, and lay the foundation for Kazakhstan to be a technological hub in Central Asia. A key part of this initiative is what they call Digital Kazakhstan, uh, an attempt to transform that the way citizens, uh, businesses, and government bureaus interact with one another, I think visitors to Kazakhstan today will find that there are uh, there is a digitalization of many aspects of life that wasn't there even five years ago. Uh, and everything from artificial intelligence to 5G, smart city technology, e-commerce, uh, and so on is part of this of part of this development. And a key element in this financial and technological innovation is the creation of the Astana International Financial Center to serve as a hub of attracting investments, uh, supporting innovations, and so forth in, in the country and in the region. Um, regarding Kazakhstan's reform in the human rights area, uh, we published a report, a shorter report on this in June, which is incorporated in the, the study. Uh, I won't go much into detail, but I'll say that there are really two areas within the uh, Kazakh government's reform in human rights, very clearly delineated. There is one area of issues where the government seems to actually work hard to achieve change, but really has struggled with finding ways to succeed. And then there is another area in which the government has been more markedly cautious in its approach. And of course, these are the areas of a more political uh, nature. Uh, 
Uh, in the first category, where I think it's clear that the government, at the top level at least, has really is trying to find ways to to uh, to change the way things are being done, includes the um, the uh, role of law enforcement in society, in which the aim is to abandon the Soviet era model in which the police is a tool of the state, in favor of a modern police force that provides service to citizens. This is very much what President Okayev has outlined. And in order to implement this, the uh, government has, has embarked on changes to the judiciary system to make the court system more adversarial, separate the close connection between prosecutors and judges that is endemic in the Soviet system or post-Soviet system, and to try to put the defense and prosecution on an equal standard in court proceedings. Uh, a second area where the government has similarly tried to achieve reform, but again, seems to be not very clear about how to actually achieve results is in the protection of women's rights, an issue that became particularly uh, gained importance and attention during the pandemic when uh, violence against women spiked, not only in Kazakhstan, but it definitely did so in a visible way that also attracted a, a, uh, a, a, a whole series of protests uh, by women against the government's inability or authorities in a seemingly in a inability to deal with, with this problem. And the president has made this issue an official priority, ordering the strengthening of special units in the Ministry of Internal Affairs, uh, focused on domestic abuse, and to start a nationwide campaign to raise attention to this problem. But it seems that while there is at the top of the system uh, an interest in doing so, as with many of these reforms, the issue is really how to change the behavior of government institutions, law enforcement, courts, and others at the local and regional level where the old ways very much are still in, uh, in vogue. Um, like I said, there are issues where the government is pro proceeding much more cautiously. Uh, those include the areas of freedom of speech and assembly and media. Um, here, President Tokayev has taken a step by affirming the importance of what he calls, quote, overcoming the fear of alternative opinion and creating a country where there are different opinions, but one nation, uh, as he likes to put it. Uh, and the idea has been to launch reforms to freedom of assembly under which peaceful rallies now require only notification rather than permission. Uh, there was a law promulgated in May last year that didn't quite go as far as the president had indicated with local executive bodies continuing to maintain various powers that would enable them to reject the holding of rallies. Uh, there are sim similarly reforms that have been introduced in the area of freedom of speech. Um, for example, the decriminalization of defamation, which was a tool that was frequently used to stop efforts to expose the wrongdoings by officials at all levels of the state. There are also laws that have been changed, for example, in, uh, the laws that talk, talked about a, a fomenting hatred, which was very vague, vague, were changed to talking about incitement of hatred instead. These changes are all quite positive, uh, but I think it is also clear that these type of changes will have an effect mainly at the time that the culture of officialdom in the country changes. What I mean by that is, that when the mentality of the justice system shifts from one that instinctively protects officials from citizens to one that protects citizens from officials. So there is a subtle and not so subtle change in the, in the mentality of state officials at all levels that needs to happen. And I think that will only happen if and when it becomes clear to all officials that the incentive structure from the top has changed, forcing them also to change the way they do business. And we'll have to see if that happens. Uh, the third category, very closely related, is the field of political participation. Uh, again, for similar reasons here, these are among the more sensitive areas where reform has been cautious. Uh, and I would say that the, the leadership of the country is torn between growing public demands for a greater voice on one hand, and the elite's inherent caution coupled with the need to manage entrenched interests that, of course, are skeptical of liberalizing reforms as they are in every country undergoing such reforms. Externally, there is a similar divide between, uh, with a government that is torn between, on the one hand, Western pressure to act faster and deeper in terms of liberalization, and as those of you who follow the geopolitics of Central Asia would uh, understand, 
On the other hand, it's a Russian and Chinese urge to maintain control over the political system at all costs. And that is nothing new for Russia. And I think China, which has traditionally not cared very much about the domestic political structure of its partners, I think Central Asia may be an exception because of the Xinjiang issue, where, of course, China would fear that more liberalization in countries like Kazakhstan would make it harder for the government of the country to maintain a quiet approach to what is going on in Xinjiang. And that is certainly the highest priority of China in this region. Now, standing between these forces, if you will, President Tokayev launched reforms that focused on the strengthening of parliament on the one hand, and on the other, on the expansion of the democratic procedures at the local level rather than at the regional or central level. Regarding the parliament, the efforts have been focused on filling the parliament with substance and ensuring it is more representative of society than it has been. Uh, the president, among other, has urged member of parliaments to be more active, to make use of their prerogative to exercise oversight over government agencies. Uh, Mr. Tokayev's first package of political reforms included measures that reduced the number of signatures needed to form a political party. Uh, these perhaps will not have a lot of change uh, or carry a lot of change. But another quota uh, was a creation of a quota for political parties to have at least 30% of women and youth on their lists. But of course, uh, this does not necessarily mean that those candidates will be on positions in those lists that actually will lead them to being, uh, to being elected. Uh, a second part of the package, including reforms to build what is called a quote, a tradition of par parliamentary opposition. Uh, and this is the first time that the country officially has recognized a role for opposition parties in the country's political system by guaranteeing the opposition a uh, chairmanship of standing committees in the parliament and the position of secretary in two standing committees in the lower chamber and for the opposition to initiate parliamentary hearings at least once per session of parliament. Now, it's important to note that these reforms focus only on the so-called systemic or loyal opposition parties and have done nothing to change the situation for those political parties that are outside, if you will, of the uh, formally accepted political systems. So it is very clear that these reforms don't aim to change anything now. They aim to create in the long term a building of parliamentary culture that involves a role, a, a role for a loyal opposition. There's also a third package of reforms this year that reduced the threshold for parliamentary representation from seven to 5%, but it remains to be seen if this will lead to the emergence of any new political uh, forces in the country. And like I said, there was a separate initiative to introduce reforms to expand the role of local of elections at the local level in order to build a culture of democracy from the grassroots up. Uh, the first rural elections held under this format did not create much change. Uh, but it is clear uh, that this is, again, a long-term process. But what we don't know is if the government plans to expand this pilot project in order to ensure the election of governors at a regional uh, level or cities as well. Now, the final area we discuss is the area of anti-corruption in the judicial system. Uh, I already talked a little bit about this in terms of the uh, changes in, in the human rights area. Uh, but both presidents Nazarbayev and Tokayev have been clear that Kazakhstan cannot move into the world's top 30 most developed nations without making serious reforms in the area of corruption. And this uh, is an area where we can see a very clear uh, and prominent role for international organizations. The reforms have been primar primarily guided by the work of the OECD's anti-corruption network, uh, which established uh, the Istanbul Anti-Corruption Action Plan. And in response to recommendations that have been given in this action plan, Kazakhstan uh, developed an anti-corruption strategy for 2015 to 2025, which has uh, a number of primary focuses, including both corruption in public service, as well as in private business, which are put on an equal level uh, by the government, as well as corruption in the judiciary, law enforcement, and so forth. Uh, to combat corruption, the government has reorganized the country's law enforcement to include an anti-corruption service that reports directly to the president. A number of regulations have also been instituted that increase accountability on gov of government officials and restrict their ability to engage in various types of corrupt behavior. Uh, one key element in this process is the digitalization also, the di digital Kazakhstan platform that reduces the opportunities for illicit interactions between citizens and government officials very much on uh, 
the model, I would say, of what was uh, started in Georgia and then was also continued in Azerbaijan after that. Uh, all of these efforts are taking place, I guess, in the context of an increased partnership with not only the OECD, but both the UNDP and OSC have been involved in, in this area. Uh, in summing up, uh, I'll return to my initial remarks, which uh, um, where I put Kazakhstan in a category of countries that are engaging in, or where the elites, I should say, have uh, realized that there is an absolute need for reforms of a political nature, not only for their own, should I say, remaining in power, but for the stability of their countries. The, the stability, they have come to realize that the stability of their countries now requires moving ahead with political reforms, not least because the days where uh, governments of oil producing countries could essentially um, by themselves political legitimacy may no longer be here. Uh, I think they have understood that those days are not coming back, uh, at least not for the long term, and that it will be necessary to achieve this form of political legitimacy in other ways. Uh, I think the big question uh, going ahead is whether the forces both internal and external that are supporting reform in these countries will be able to carry the day and the balance will tip in their favor uh, in terms of the bigger challenges that exist, both challenges of a security nature that pushes governments towards continued uh, political control, but also the forces within their own governments and within their own societies uh, that are influential today and that will stand to lose from reforms. Um, and I think what we learned, if anything, from ex experiences like Georgia is that the political will at the top of the political system and the relentless focus on implementing these changes are absolutely crucial for any reforms to, to be sustainable and succeed. I would recommend to you Dr. Engvall's paper on how Georgia fought corruption, uh, uh, which discusses this in great detail, as well as perhaps his study of Kyrgyzstan as well, that shows how maybe things did not work out. Uh, definitely, we see in Kazakhstan uh, efforts to move the country in this direction, uh, and uh, we hope to come back um, to, uh, to see how it has worked. Uh, there is very little, of course, already in terms of uh, international rank rankings that show uh, in, what, in which direction it is headed. We can clearly see, however, that in anti-corruption uh, rankings, there is a move in terms of Kazakhstan moving in the right direction. And various type of uh, indices, such as the Heritage Fund, uh, the Cato Institute's uh, Index of, on Human Freedom also shows some progress. Others, such as Freedom House, remain more skeptical. But I suppose in uh, several years from now, we can come back and, uh, and be more, have more facts on the table about where, things, where the chips have fallen. As well. I was spoken too, too long. Johan, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Santa. Um, thank you for this. Is in the right direction? No, it's the wrong direction. It's always the wrong direction. So thank you for this very thorough overview of the Kayev's reform agenda. Uh, now I look forward to hearing from our commentators. Uh, let's start with Alia, please. Um, thank you. Good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Um, thank you very much for including me and um, it's great to be even virtually back um, to ISDP and uh, I was very happy to read the report. It's very comprehensive and I, and I commend you for that, uh, for an enormous job that you've done, um, Swante. So it's fantastic to see, to see the work um, out. I would like to start with maybe posing questions first and then um, we can um, have a more uh, grounded discussion and I'll have my comments um, on, top, on top of your answers, if I may. And um, some of the questions that I have are um, to the paper, but also what you, you said right now in, in the presentation. And uh, first of all, I want to start with that from your paper, it seems to me that most of the areas for the reforms are very similar to reforms in the previous decades that has been happening since the independence period. We're talking about, again, economic diversification, political reforms, governance, anti-corruption, all those reforms in these areas. And um, your report is quite descriptive, albeit very, very comprehensive. 
in its uh, in its range. Um, so I wonder whether you can give us an example of an impact from the reforms in the past and the current ones. Would you say that past reforms were not successful and hence they, they're, they're still a need to implement more and new ones? Or what is what would be your definition of successful reforms? Because again, when we talk about reforms, what is our kind of um, benchmark in understanding whether reforms are working or not working? Um, my second point and, and second question is um, all of re your reforms that you mentioned um, um, are quite, again, as, as I said, quite comprehensive and expensive in nature. Um, most of them, um, or at least um, um, some of them in, in majority cases, are in partnership with the either European partners or other donor organizations such as World Bank, OECD, um, ADB, and the others. And you essentially mentioned that in your paper. So I wonder whether you can go a little bit more in depth in understanding what is the role of these external actors in pushing the reforms. Are they active? Are they, again, uh, very, very engaged? Who, who has the agency in terms of driving those reforms? And, and then again, I would, I would urge you to reflect on the effectiveness of such external engagement. Um, again, how much how much input can 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 this partnership organization happen? Especially, I bring this uh, in in the as a reflection towards um, the partnerships that you met, um, we have between the EU and the Eastern Neighborhood um, uh, countries. And you mentioned Lord Georgia or Azerbaijan or Ukraine for that matter. So again, how much. Um, that Eastern partnership actually helps in driving those reforms in those countries and, and how the lack of an Eastern partnership program with Central Asian um, hinders um, such reforms in, in, in this region. And third and final point, but not certainly not, not, not the exhaustive, um, it's, um, it almost feels like a normative statement um, that you know, the reforms are good and always are good, that you know, reforming is necessary. So my question is that, is there a reform for the sake of reform? Um, what is the kind of, what is the end goal in here? Um, is the end goal is like once Kazakhstan reaches OECD, it becomes a member of OECD. Um, once it becomes the 30th uh, uh, most competitive nation. Um, and again, a little bit in terms of effect and also what, what you mentioned that or, or we, we might revisit this in a couple of years. Well, we have 30 years of independence. I think it's a good year um, to reflect on the on, on, on the reforms in that matter. Um, well, again, in a way of, of a methodology of reforms, you talked a lot of um, and what seems to me a very top down approach um, to reforms. So the government makes um, a statement and programs and then implements reforms. How much can we bring actually uh, a bottom up approach as well? And, and, and again, the way that the reforms are implemented or structured, does that also hinder the effectiveness of, of the reforms? I'll leave it at that, but I have many, many comments and I was so looking forward to, to an open discussion later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, maybe we turn to Damjan, please. And then Swanti can pick up on these questions and reflections and we have a discussion. Please, Damjan. Sure, thank you very much. I'm pleased to share the screen with everyone. I have an awful cold and apologize in advance if I cough and sneeze and my voice rasps and all that. Um, my first hand impressions of Kazakhstan's reform, these are first hand impressions that go back nearly two decades now, uh, have been deepened by the impressive content of, uh, of today's report and, and previous ones in the series. And I think that its authors make a persuasive case that the set of economic and political reformist undertakings in both design and execution, uh, that they work well in concert with one another and that they're delivering in many ways impressive results. And so the story of Kazakhstan that emerges on the basis of the present report is one of leadership and success and foresight and, and perseverance and a commitment to whole scale modernization, top down modernization, but modernization nonetheless. That being said, I don't want to, I don't intend to speak directly this evening to the various modes and orders of the reform process that's underway. Uh, nor of the intricacies of Kazakhstan's development model. But instead, what I'd like to do in the next 
let's say eight minutes, is to sketch out the international and the regional environment within which these modernization processes are taking place and seem likely to take place in the future. And I'd like to do that by making three points. Point number one, the balance of power in Eurasia, or what I think should be called the Silk Road region, is in the midst of a transformative shift. It's a balance of power that favors homegrown integration with its main architects and core participants being from the region itself. Now, this great shift has been both accelerated and, and entrenched by the geopolitical consequences of the Second Karabakh War and the US-led withdrawal from Afghanistan. And what can we observe here? Well, economic integration proposals have gained a new impetus on both sides of the Caspian. So let's quickly start with a Moscow-mediated document that ended the conflict over Karabakh. When you read this document, you see that it mandates a broad and interconnected set of economic normalization arrangements. And once these are put in place, they're going to reverberate far beyond Armenia and Azerbaijan. Now, the strategically most important one is a direct road and rail route from Nakhchivan through Armenia to mainland um, Azerbaijan. And upon completion, this is going to become the most direct transportation route from Anatolia to Central Asia. But I want to underline that this, that what was agreed last year is just the first step, because deriving from this is the proposed three plus three format for regional uh, cooperation and uh, connectivity. Now, the gist of three plus three is to build upon the terms and the underlying logic of this Moscow brokered agreement, such that Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia enter into an arrangement with Iran, Russia, and Turkey to cooperate on, at the very least, economic issues affecting this part of the region. Now, at the same time, Central Asia, including Afghanistan, has also been making strides towards institutionalizing regional economic connectivity. The scale and scope of the plans now being laid call to mind older arrangements in other geographies, ASEAN, the Nordic Council, the Gulf Cooperation Council, and even the original 1957 European Economic Community. Now, all of you presumably know that the seeds of regional integration, at least in Central Asia, were first planted by President Nazarbayev in the 1990s. And it's his conceptual vision, more than anyone else's, that's now becoming uh, fecund. So the, the, the fertilizer, as it were, that spurs the growth of these seeds was able to be, to be deposited properly across the region only after a changing of the guard in, in, in Uzbekistan. And soon thereafter, as everyone knows, I think we have a, we have a text-based process of Central Asian economic connectivity and regionalization that's starting up again. So this was November, 2017. And since then it's continued in various formats. Now, the important point here is that the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan hasn't stalled the momentum of such talks. The rotors of all those helicopters flying around Kabul this past summer didn't blow away the fertilizer and the seeds and all that, if I can keep going with this awful analogy. Now, a major reason is that pretty much every country that matters in the Silk Road region has had senior level contacts with the Taliban for years. So pragmatic understandings, non-exclusionary contingency plans, all of this was made on time. So the Western withdrawal from Afghanistan was, previous, was, was obviously a geopolitical earthquake, but the main, main damage happened not where one would first think. So you had immediate tremors that were felt near and far, but the major aftershocks were localized to Washington and Brussels and a few other Western capitals. So what do we see as a consequence of all this activity? Geopolitical and security and economic integration developments on either side of the Caspian are being driven by those belonging to the region itself. So again, three plus three in the South Caucasus and concrete talks on some sort of a treaty proposal to propel, for, for, to propel forward economic connectivity in the core of, of, of Central Asia. Now, this is important. Neither process is predicated on the embrace of contemporary Western preferences in either governance or growth models. Moreover, these processes very purposefully exclude full Western participation and will likely exclude Western membership. And of course, the same can be said of existing regional arrangements in this part of the world, Belt and Road, Turkic Council, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and so on. So in short, everywhere we look in the Silk Road region, we have regional driven connectivity that's on the way in and Western influence that's on the way out. Now, this brings me to point number two. We all remember how Zbigniew Brzezinski popularized the metaphor of the grand chessboard and how this metaphor then went on to frame mainstream geopolitical thinking about this part of the world. And my argument is that it's outdated and, and perhaps even dangerous. And, and what I'd like to propose as a, as, a, as a replacement is that of a card table. So 
picture, if you will, a room with a card table. You've got various placers that are various players that are staying where they are. Some have retaken their seats. Others are coming through the door for the first time. A few just decided to get up from their chairs, but seem to want to remain in the room. And all the while the deck is being reshuffled and new cards are soon going to be dealt. Now, an evident conceptual advantage to seeing Eurasia as a card table is that there can be more than two real players. This is obviously not the case with chess and Brzezinski was obviously aware of this, but still it's his metaphor. And it's unavoidable implication is that the White House and the Kremlin were the, were the region's only true uh, independent players. They and they alone controlled the board and the movement of pieces and the formulation of strategies. But that's not how it works at a card table. There's plenty of room for more chairs to be added without disrupting the general flow. New players can join, old ones can fall by the wayside, anyone can cash out at any time, more or less. Now, for reasons of time, I don't have, I'm not gonna be able to develop fully this metaphor, but suffice it to say here that the overall point of the card table idea is, is pretty simple. If you have what it takes, or if you think you do, you can pull up a chair and take a seat at the card table and partake in the great game. And if you don't, you can pack up, even walk out of the room. And if your fortunes change and circumstances allow, you can be dealt back in. But regardless, the great game goes on. Now, my third and final substantive point, building on the first two, is this. The grand chessboard metaphor presupposes that the Silk Road region was, is, and will remain an object of great power relations. And, and the metaphor of the card table works better because Eurasia, the Silk Road region, is, or at least is becoming, or at least has the potential to become, a fully fledged, distinct, and emancipated subject of an international order. In other words, the card table metaphor accepts the possibility uh, of the autonomous geopolitical development of the states that geographically belong to the region itself. And this conforms to the overarching geopolitical reality that I think we see in this part of the world today. Now, what for me is particularly interesting is that this reality is characterized by the fact that its leading states are all middle powers at the very most. So uh, the fellow who coined this term centuries ago, Giovanni Botero, defined middle powers as states that have sufficient force and authority to stand on their own without the need of help from others. So leaders of middle powers tend to be acutely aware of the dexterity that's required to maintain security and project influence in a more or less prudential manner beyond their immediate borders. And because of that, middle powers are apt to have facility in promoting trade and connectivity with their neighbors and their neighbors' neighbors. Now, unquestionably, in my mind, Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan are such middle powers. And they're the keystones and the anchors of the Silk Road region. Today's report calls them regional powerhouses. So none by itself is indispensable, <clears throat> but together they provide equilibrium while setting the tone and the pace and the scope of the overall cooperation agenda. So you have some external powers who are exerting some influence, but developments, generally speaking, in the region are unlikely to keep being decisively driven and much less determined by the oftentimes clashing agendas and preferences and objectives and priorities of the great powers. So um, another characteristic is that these middle powers, these keystone states embrace elements of both autonomy and restraint, uh, a soft balancing approach to foreign policy making. And a third characteristic is the salience of a 21st century version of what in the 1990s was called Asian values. And I think this is really important. And obviously I don't have time to provide a full typology of these values but I can give you two traits that I think illustrate this underappreciated phenomenon. One, <clears throat> let's call them Silk Road values. Silk Road values are broadly suspicious of outsiders placing uh, soft law-driven limitations on national sovereignty, like the narrowing of the scope of the principle of non-intervention in the internal affairs of states. Another trait uh, of these Silk Road values uh, is that they generally downplay ethnic and even civic nationalism in favor of what Anatol Levin calls uh, state nationalism. Right, fidelity to the state is embodied by loyalty to its leadership and the reformist policies it's generating and executing. And by the way, there's an underappreciated meritocratic element in this sort of conception, at least in some of the countries concerned, certainly in the cases of Kazakhstan and, and Azerbaijan and probably Uzbekistan. 
And in these cases, at least, I would argue that the body politic in its entirety <clears throat> is aware that those entrusted with the responsibility of designating and executing reforms are gonna be judged primarily by results. And if they fall short, they'll be replaced without much fanfare, even less sentiment and zero recompense. Obviously, I'm not talking about the people at the very top, but everybody else. Now, I'm not sure that this is entirely compatible with the contemporary tenets of liberal democracy as practiced in places like Iceland or New Zealand, but it sure seems to be in line with the sound age old principles of responsible government. So let me wrap up quickly. My bottom line assessment is that the, the region's keystone states are attempting to establish their own set of initiatives and institutions. And when you take them together, they represent a surge of interdependence and connectivity and integration. And this may very well result in the construction of a genuinely stable and lasting regional order. And a regional order that advances, first and foremost, the interests and values of the region, by the region, and for the region. And so it's within this sort of regional context that we ought to understand the intention of the tremendous political and economic reforms underway in Kazakhstan and elsewhere, like Azerbaijan and various other countries that make up the core of the region. And the idea really is, I think, is to transform it in the world, in the words of today's report, into a region that's characterized by, I'm quoting, modern, open, and self-governing societies. And that's more than I think anybody would have expected 30 years ago. Thank you very much. Thank you, Damjan. Um, and thank you also to Aliyah for, for both of your interesting remarks here. Um, do you want to address these Unless right now? I was thinking about this also because uh, this made me thinking also both this uh, Aliyah's focus on the, the reforms here and how to evaluate them and, and also what's driving them. But also uh, Damjan's focus here on, on this um, putting, seeing Kazakhstan's policies here and reforms in, in, uh, in the context of an emerging, much more beneficial, actually, regional order. But maybe I throw in a couple of things. Uh, maybe you can almost call, almost call them dilemmas that I was thinking about when I, when I heard first you want to speak, and when I read, of course, also parts of, of, of your, your paper here. But you mentioned that there are these uh, quite a lot of in initiatives here. Yeah? Um, and I wonder, is there a risk that it becomes too, too much of all this, yeah? too scattered? Uh, so it's becoming very difficult to, to implement. Would it then maybe be an alternative to, I mean, is there a risk that they are focusing on too much? So could an alternative be to focus on a few areas and work on these more substantially or systematically? and then maybe build momentum uh, for, for, for adding new initiatives or things like that. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking a little bit also about this, that my, maybe there might be a risk also with these very, as you mentioned, lofty goals yeah, and these long-term visions. While, while it's probably, of course, uh, very positive to have this type of long time term vision for, for, for society and, and the economy and the political system. But maybe there might also be a risk with, with this type of policy that you, you tend to see everything in this long term perspective. So maybe you forget about those urgent things that needs to be addressed right now. Yeah? So, so in a way you get detached maybe from society or the most pressing needs right now that might be necessary for for this lo longer term, that it, to have this balance. Uh, that's one thing I was thinking about, if you might share something on. Uh, and the other thing that comes up to my mind is this, when you, when I think about this, is that, um, um, is this aspect of formal and informal relationships. You, you touched upon this. Uh, uh, the, of course, there's one thing to draft a lot of new laws, establish new agencies, um, also introduce um, digital Kazakhstan or things like that. But if the mindset or the, you know, is still this that you, you want to have um, control and these type of things, uh, um, these type of new initiatives can also be used in, in like, you know, to confer, uh, in a way to, to, to also strengthen this control and rather than maybe opening up society. Um, so, so here I was thinking also about, on the one hand, you have a government here 
in Kazakhstan with an extremely strong focus on, understandably, on security and um, sovereignty. I mean, for various reasons, of course. I mean, cultural reasons, you know, circumstances or the geographical reality surrounded by, by uh, Russia and China and and so on. So, so, so that aspect is, of course, central. But on the other hand, they also have this very strong focus on advancing social and economic uh, development. Uh, but for that, so, so if you need for sovereignty and all that, you need a strong state, a state strong control, yeah. Uh, here, you know, for social and economic development, uh, you could argue that there's less control in a way is needed here. You need to open up more here uh, for giving people greater freedom in a way and try to, to be entrepreneurial or not be harassed by tax officials or, or whatever, come up with new ideas and a more innovative climate uh, and other things. So how to strike a balance between these uh, things? I mean, if there's someone you should ask this from, I think it's you, or the, you know, head of the Institute for Security and Development Policy. Here is really where, where these meet. So um, yeah, these are my, my reflections. So Svante, please. Well, thank you. And thank you to all of you, I think. Uh, uh, I, I wish I could take credit for uh, for the wonderful contrast between the two commentators. I think you complemented each other wonderfully in a way that I wish I would have expected, but it was um, uh, it was more accidental than than intentional, frankly. Uh, but I think it, it actually it, it worked out very well because I think Alia, you pointed very much to very real questions about reform processes like the one, and of course. Um, what I hear in your comments is that you've maybe seen this movie before or a movie that looks like this movie before. But this is not the first time, in fact, over many, many years, uh, there have been so many initiatives coming out of, of the Kazakh capital. Um, and I think in the report, we actually go through uh, some of the elements of reforms that were tried before and didn't work. Um, so I think your questions are very well taken. Uh, at the same time, Dungeon, I think you provided the broader context. And in fact, I think you answered some of Alia's questions. I think most particularly uh, what, what I think was the most crucial question is what's the end goal? And I think the end goal, uh, I think, uh, if I may interpret your question, is, is this really, uh, an, is the end goal of this type of reform to, uh, to change fundamentally the way the state and society interact with each other, uh, or does it have to do with positioning the state both uh, for its own survival and for the survival of the people who run the state going forward? Uh, and I think it actually is very much related to what Damian says. Uh, I think the, 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 the reforms, one of the main focus of the reforms, not the only one, but is to position Kazakhstan as a capable middle power that uh, I think for countries that have these ambitions, uh, that are ambitions on a regional level, um, but I have to say that having an ambition on a regional level also is related to maintaining your sovereignty and avoiding the type of sometimes catastrophic interventions into your own state and society that we've seen in places like Georgia and Ukraine in the past decade. Uh, so everything is related. The foreign is related to the domestic and vice versa. But it seems to me that one of the driving forces of these reforms is that, you know, if we are to function in this very acute geopolitical environment with the Russians and the Chinese and whoever else around us, to maintain our independence, to keep them at bay, to be able to act, uh, to, I, let me put it like, to be able to be taken seriously by some of these great powers, we have to have our own act in order to some extent. And I think that's one of the main driving for that's one of the main driving forces of the reforms. And I think in a way that is one of the end goals of the reforms. The other one I think has to do with the generational change that is definitely taking place everywhere in this region. Uh, we see that it's not, of course, a completed generational change in most of these countries. If you look at the people who hold the principles, if you will, the cabinet ministers and above. Uh, some of them belong to the younger generation that is not really Soviet in terms of their education, but most actually are still. There is still a very heavy influence of the last, if you will, the last Soviet generation. Uh, 
But I think uh, among the younger uh, generation that are now beginning to definitely and for a while have been in positions as deputy ministers and the like, and increasingly coming up to the ministerial level, I think there is a realization that we can't go on like this. We have to change some of the ways in which we're operating. And paradoxically, I think the, the process of these color revolutions and the Arab Spring for that matter, has really woken up people in many of these countries who believe, who are within the system and to some extent believe that the system can function and can change because the way they look at it, uh, and I think especially in Kazakhstan, I think no other country uh, that I know has a leadership been so explicit in saying, that, looking at these color revolutions and saying, this is not what we want. Look at what happened to these countries that have undergone these type of revolutionary transformations. We don't want that. Now, having said that, well, how do you avoid it? How do you make sure that you don't end up in a situation with this type of rev revolutionary change? Well, then you actually have to make sure that this doesn't happen. And I think the interesting thing to me is that in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan and Central Asia, there's been a realization that you can't just engage in repression. Uh, it's not enough, it's not gonna work. Um, and maybe it's not feasible. I don't know which one of these it is that they've concluded, but they, in any way they're concluded that the, the way going forward cannot be based on repression alone. Now, obviously some, uh, President Tokayev has been very clear. Uh, we want people to express their opinions, but be careful. We're not going to accept any revolutionary behavior or any hooliganism, basically. Uh, so there's always the, yes, we want more debate, we want more discussion, but there's always a caveat uh, within a certain framework and within certain limits. And I think that is also related to the picture that Damjan painted for us of a very delicate uh, uh, situation in which they've seen how any type of internal divides within these countries immediately can be, uh, can be uh, exacerbated by foreign intervention. Um, and that also then goes to the question of benchmarks. And I think this is a very interesting one because we saw, should I say maybe five, five to seven years ago, and uh, this actually gets borne out in some of the international rankings, that that's really when this region bottomed out, if you will. Uh, five to seven years ago is when they were at their worst. And we've seen a very modest, but still an upward tick in, in many of these in indexes. Uh, not you, we, we could spend another hour criticizing the international indexes, but that's not the discussion here. What I, what I mean to say is that until about five to seven years ago, they were not really interested anymore in their relationship with the West. Uh, this was something that they saw as a problem. Many of these leaders saw the West as sponsors of revolutions and the like. But I think what we've seen over the past five years, and I think it's clearly timeable to the oil price collapse of 2014 to 15, is that if there is a consensus that we need to engage in reform, where are we gonna look? It's not gonna be to China and it's not gonna be to Russia. And that's why you see a certain level of re-engagement and not so much with individual countries, but with the Western led international organizations uh, in the Uzbek case, it's very clear that it's the United Nations. That's where they are focusing most of their most of their attention. How much that is going to lead to anything, I don't know. But in Kazakhstan, we see things like the OECD. We even see, to some extent, Kazakhstan approaching the Venice Commission of the Council of Europe with some of its political reforms. And the answer is always, well, yes, this is all good, but it's not enough, right? That's what the Venice Commission is going to say. And I think that's very predictable. So I think the, the thing for Kazakhstan, which is both a promise and a, and a curse in a way, is that they have, they have benchmarked they sell themselves very highly. And the question is, how do you deliver? And even if your end goal is something different, uh, when you've benchmarked yourself to the OECD and you have you know, the population of Kazakhstan hearing every day that we're going to be this, we're going to be that, we're going to be among the 30 most developed countries, what happens if you don't deliver? And I think that is going to put, what, I, what my, my hope is that this creates a kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way that the government puts itself, becomes a prisoner of its own rhetoric and then has to, uh, so to speak, take one step after another to begin to fulfill on its promises. What I think is really the big question that is out there, and I alluded to this in, in my introduction, is that nobody really knows how you reform a post-Soviet system. Uh, nobody's really succeeded. Uh, for a while, the Georgians looked like they were very successful. Now we see how easy it is to backtrack on some of the on some of the reforms that, that, that have been successful. 
Um, and we we're seeing now a different model. I'm not saying that this is necessarily bound to succeed, but I'm, 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 what I am saying is that we see a new pattern and we see a pattern in which Kazakhstan is in many ways taking the lead into this. Uh, and you identified it, Alia, very correctly. This is very much a top-down model. There is, yes, there is, a, there is a particular space, the National Council of Public Trust, where a selected number of people, and I emphasize the selected people, are, are invited to contribute. But this is not something where the government is, uh, is soliciting you know, anybody and everybody's uh, su suggestions and proposals. Uh, I think the, the developmental model has not changed. It's very much one that is led by elite consensus. And I think that probably connects again to what, um, what Danjan talks about, the emerging, I like your idea of the emerging Silk Road values, where this elite level consensus may be another one that you could add to that. Uh, I'm not sure this answers all the questions, but at least that is, uh, that's the best I can do. Um, Johan, back to you. Thank you. Yeah, I see that we're running out of time. It's uh, we don't have any questions. No, no questions. So, yeah, then I think um, I, want, I want to thank especially our two guests, Alia Tsai and Damjan Krinjevich Mishkovic, for your extremely interesting input to this uh, study from and speech from, from Svante Cornell. And we look forward to, to reading this. Uh, I don't know when the paper will be, it should published. be online next week. Perfect. Okay, so I want to thank also our audience for, for um, tuning in and uh, I advise you to access the, the report from the homepage, isdp.org, yeah? EU. EU. <laughs> and at silkroadstudies.org. Also, yeah, where you can access it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.